Please welcome Mariska Hargate. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. This is so much fun having you because, I mean, like, Law & Order, I've watched my whole life, and I watched your show in South Africa. It's big. Mm. And I, I always wonder, like, when you've played a character like Olivia Benson for as long as you have, do you sometimes feel like you, like, know the law? Like, do you ever feel like you are in law enforcement sometimes? No. no. I, absolutely, I feel like I do. And I'm also somebody that jumps in and gets confused about what my real job is. <laughs> There have been times in my life where I've seen something on the street and I jump in like, hey, put that down, get in here, come <laughs> here. And I've done it so many times. I'm like, Mershka, you need to calm down. Yeah, but I... Seriously. I feel like you play your character so convincingly that if you did that to me in real life, I'd be like, yeah, it's law and order. Ah! I'd be like, it's law and order. <laughs> no, it's been fun. You know, this, this, when you do something... Right. For 19 years, I started the show when I was four. <laughs> and when you... Did, no, but when you do something... Why is he laughing? That feels weird. I'm gonna be 23. Anyway, um, I... I um, when you do something for this long, you know, your body sort of reacts to right, it. Right, right, right. So when I get... When there's crisis, I go into crisis mode. I, I like that. I like that a lot. I go into I, lieutenant mode. Go into lieutenant mode. I'm not in that mode right now. <laughs> The, um, the, the, the show is, is an interesting one because, you know, Law & Order has so many different spin-offs, spin but Special Victims Unit is one that connected with so many people in a yeah. visceral way. Mm. Because we were, we were used to glamorous crimes, you know? It was always all the murder, it was the this, it was the swindling, it was the... But Special Victims Unit tackled something that, like, a lot of people have experienced, unfortunately. Mm. You know, the Me Too movement has, has exposed how pervasive sexual assault and harassment have been, and that's, that's what your show has been covering, covering for so long. Mm -hmm. You went through an interesting experience where people who were victims and, and survivors of sexual assault or harassment reached out to your character. Like, they wrote you fan mail and asked they you did. for help. Like, they actually went, I need your help. Did people not know that your character wasn't real, or, or, or was it something else? You know, I think that for so long, um, survivors have been living in a culture of, um, of shame and isolation. Uh, when I started the show, I started... I'd come off ER. And right. so when you're, you know, getting normal fan mail, you get, hi, I love your show, can I get an autographed photo? And <clears throat> all of a sudden, when I started SVU, after the show had been airing for a while, I started getting a very different kind of fan letter um, with victims actually disclosing their stories of abuse, and many for the first time. And in those letters, there always was the same theme, again, of shame, stigma, and isolation. Right. Isolation. And them saying, I've never told anyone before, and not feeling safe to tell anyone or feeling scared that it wouldn't, they wouldn't be believed or it wouldn't be received right. So right. I think that they went to this f fictionalized character that maybe was the first person that showed empathy and compassion. And they knew that Olivia was always for the victim first and felt safe there. And hopefully now that is indeed changing. Right, and that's a powerful connection for people to have with a character and with a, with, with a show. And it's something that I think many people would find overwhelming. I don't know if I'd be able to handle that. I don't know how I would handle it. But you, <clears throat> you took it and turned it into something really positive. You started your foundation, Joyful Heart. What is Joyful Heart all about? Thank you. Well, I, you know, when I started getting these letters, as you can imagine, I was um, shocked and wanted to respond and was so... Uh, it, it was very painful mm -hmm. receiving these letters and I, I didn't know how to respond so I tried to, to educate myself and uh, I was so enraged when I learned about the statistics of sexual assault that, that one in three women and one in six men will be abused in their lifetime. I mean, this, what, these were crazy statistics and I thought if, if those were the statistics, uh, one in four women will be assaulted by her 18th birthday. H how is it that everybody wasn't talking about this. This right. was an epidemic. So that's when I started educating myself and when I did um, my research for the role of, of playing Olivia, besides hanging out <clears throat> in 
police, you know, precincts and with cops and doing ride-alongs. I also went through a 40-hour training to become a rape crisis advocate, which taught me wow. how to deal with survivors because I knew I wanted to play this character um, in, in a different way with all of myself and all of my humanity and empathy and, and, and femininity and not in, you know, a, a female in a man's world and not in a, in a sort of male way, right. um, you know, playing this hard-ass, you know, badass detective who, as we all have different sides of us, also has compassion, empathy, yes. and, and humanity, as I said. So um, that's when I sort of put a structure to, to my anger and started the Joyful Heart Foundation to help victims reclaim, you know, their reclaim their lives or claim possibility and joy. And then in 2009, I learned about the rape kit backlog. Right. In 2009, I learned about, uh, there was a study done by Human Rights Watch that exposed this <laughs> unbelievable travesty in our nation that when a woman was brave enough and courageous enough to come forward after being assaulted and would go through a four to six hour, often completely invasive and often re-traumatizing examination. Mm -hmm. And they would do, you know, a sexual assault evidence, you know, collection kit and poke them and prod them. And, you know, it's a humiliating, painful process. And then we found out that these kits were sitting on shelves in police storage facilities. And you would assume that in America, in this country, obviously, if the evidence collection kit was, was, was taken, it would be processed. Right. And we found that, that that wasn't the case. And I found out the first case was, uh, um, the first time I found out about it was the study done in, in, in California, in Los Angeles, that there were 12,000, I think, 669 kits. So the following year, I went to testify before Congress. And that's when I met this amazing badass of a woman named Kim Worthy, who was the Wayne County prosecutor, right. who was also testifying. And when we met, it was, we were done. You, you, <laughs> you know, it was a little bit of a match right. made in heaven. And, and you, you've been on a journey ever since. And this documentary, I think, is in many ways a culmination of that journey, because this story is illuminating in so many different ways. We learn about these rape kits that are taken. Uh, we learn about the experiences of these women who have survived these horrific incidents. And then we learn that there are just backlogs. There are kits that are sitting on shelves and rapists are walking free in the streets. Some people may say, okay, that, that, that's bad, but there, there's, there's a story in particular where one woman rape was tied to another woman's yeah. rape 13 years later. Is, is this a story that you come across often? Well, you know, the, the rape kit backlog, which, of course, after we found that there were, you know, this was the same, the same story in every city. Right. Right? And there are estimated hundreds of thousands of, of rape kits sitting in police storage facility, and there are so many reasons to test these kids, but not testing them clearly sends a message to survivors saying, you don't matter, right. and your kit doesn't matter, and your case doesn't matter, and it certainly tells perpetrators, well, it doesn't matter, continue. Right. What we learned is that by putting the DNA in the, in the CODIS, which is the national database, we kept finding hits and that there were so many serial rapists. Kim found in Detroit, I think out of 11,000 kits, there were 800, 879 serial rapists. So in the movie, which was very you know, difficult to put together, this imagine. was my first documentary, and we interviewed 14 women, right. all with the most, who were so extraordinarily brave, but with these compelling stories. And I'll tell you, I could have made a documentary on each one of these women right. their, with their stories. But you know, a documentary, how do you tell the story? How do you weave it together? And then we found that one of, one of the rapists was indeed a, um, a truck driver who uh, had, hadn't been apprehended. Right. And one of the women was waiting uh, 11 years, 14 years, for the precinct to call her back. They never did. And in the meantime, he was busy assaulting other women. 
it's, it's so yeah it's, it's a story that that is enraging it's, it's enraging it's, it's frustrating um, uh, and at the same time uplifting because of what we see in the documentary mm. we see the work that your organization is doing we see the work that these women are doing fighting this process what can be done though some people go it's a backlog the police department cannot do anything but new york oh, city has can. done something what can be and done and i i i wanted to make this movie because it's so hard hard hitting and and again when i found out about it in 2009 you know, my head almost exploded. I, I just remember going, this can't, this cannot be. Right. It, it can't be. This is America. How, it can't be. And I remember doing a satellite media tour the following year, and, and none of the journalists, nobody knew. They'd go, wait, what? They would stop me and say, you're telling me that the woman <laughs> goes through this examination and they're right. not testing the kids? And so <clears throat> this is an incredibly, you know, how do you measure uh, sexual assault in this country? How do you measure how women are being treated? And that's what I thought. This is a perfect sort of microcosm right. of how we treat women, how we treat survivors. And uh, it's sort of like sort of holds a mirror up to the country and says, right. this is what we're doing, so let's change it. The good news is it's fixable. The good news is that Joyful Heart, the, my foundation that I, that I founded in 2004, has been, has made the rape kit uh, backlog, our number one advocacy priority. And so we have made these six pillars of legislation that we're trying to push through, and, the, and, and we are changing legislation in every state. Um, New York doesn't have a backlog, thank God, and um, certain, certain states by states and cities by cities are cleaning up their backlog. Right. So you can go to endthebacklog.org and find out what you can do, write to your legislators, write to your congressmen, and we can change it. We just have to be persistent and never give up. I think that sounds amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Show. I Am Evidence debuts Monday, April 16th at 8 p.m. on HBO. And for more information about how you can help, visit endthebacklog.org. Mariska Hargitay, everybody.